John, what's going on, man? Hey, nothing, man. Just out here in beautiful Long Beach, Washington, just enjoying the uh, the cooler weather. Are you near that uh, Airstream Park? I am, yeah. I'm actually in Seaview. I am probably two blocks oh. from that place, or three, yeah. yeah. How's it going? Good, good, good. Just busy, um, just trucking along, yeah. We need to collaborate <laughs> yeah. on some weirdo music again. That'd be a lot of fun, man. I, I definitely enjoyed that. Yes, that was a good time in my life. Yeah. Um, I know you've been playing bagpipes forever, but it, it seems like it has a bigger role in your life now. And it sounds like it's developed some stories. But uh, give us the journey of, of where you are now on the pipes. Sure. So I started when I was 14 bagpiping. That was really my first instrument. And I played, uh, you know, in in bagpipe bands and competitions when I was young till my mid twenties, I think. And there's sort of a rigorous process where you're competing and you're getting better and you're getting graded into higher grades and started doing, uh, solo work for extra cash. You know, it's nice 15, 16, 17, be able to go out and play a wedding and, you know, have all this cash in your pocket. So I did that for a long time, but just sort of not super seriously, like, I was very serious about bagpipes, but doing it as a, as a way of getting money was just not one of really my main thoughts. And then later on, when I was about 20, 21, I started playing with like weird alt rock bands, a band from San Diego called Crash Worship and doing that kind of stuff. And then kind of that sort of fizzled out, like just, you know, you grow older or whatever. And so then maybe six or seven years ago, I was working a job that I wasn't super psyched on. And I was like, you know what? I'm playing bagpipes again. And somebody threw me a bone. They threw me a lead to go play uh, a funeral service. And I was like, oh, wow, this totally works for me. And so I just jumped right back in. I ended up quitting my job and just started doing like weddings and funerals and just other events Uh, since like, I think 2016, I've been doing it now, just trying to do it full time, you know, it's been a really sort of fun and very sort of interesting trajectory or interesting, you know, experiences. Right. And, um, I mean, there's no shortage of uh, people getting married or dying. No. And it's always just really trippy, trippy times. I'm going to take these small pipes off. Like just recently I was playing for a college graduation for Reed, Reed college. Mm -hmm. And I'd finished playing and these people were out in front of their house because you, you kind of have to park in a neighborhood to go over to Reed College. Mm-hmm. And these people were talking and you could tell they're all neighbors. And one of them looks over at me and he's like, oh, man, you know, like you you finished with the graduation. Are you going to play for us? And I was like, mm-hmm. sure. You know, I got out my bagpipes, assembled them and then played them a little bit for them. And the guy goes, oh, wow, you know. I'd really like to have you come out and play. We do whiskey, uh, yearly whiskey tastings. And so I hand him my card and he goes, John Goff. And I was expecting him to say like, I know John Goff. And he goes, you played my son's funeral in February. And it's kind of crazy stuff like that, where it's, it's a small community and you're doing pretty intense events. So it's, you, you kind of, you never know where you're going to be or what you're going to do. You know, you walk into something. I, I was hired to go play down in Eugene and I was going to this uh, metal foundry shop and the owner had passed away. So they were doing like a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. And so it was mobbed. I mean, there was tons and tons of people. And so I, and there are bikers and all sorts of stuff. And so they're like, okay, we want you to play Amazing Grace right after. And they'd taken one of those old flintlock rifles. They'd taken his ashes and they'd stuck it and made a bullet out of it, like Uh. a shotgun. And they shot it over the building and over the whole area. And that's when I played Amazing Grace as they're all drinking shots of like Southern Comfort. This sounds like rock and roll touring. Yeah. Um one of the best jokes I've ever heard was I was playing down in 
like Salem or Corvallis. I can't remember. It was a graveside service. It was right at the beginning of COVID. It was like right at the beginning. So it was like, there wasn't any shots out. Like everybody's kind of freaked out and it was really hardcore restrictions. So I guess eight people or whatever it is, plus me and the preacher are out on this, this blustery sort of, you know, kind of rainy, cloudy day. And they're all six feet apart. They're all spaced in chairs. They've all got masks on. And so it's a real solemn event. So the priest says, um, uh, you know, I, I knew the deceased quite well. He had a, a, he had a great sense of humor. And he says, you know, he told me this, this one joke. He said, a dog patient walks into a dog doctor's office. And the dog doctor looks at the dog patient and says, I've gotten your stool sample back and it was delicious. I'm the only one laughing. Like I'm sitting there trying not to like bust up. He's laughing, but everybody else is just stone cold sitting, which made it even worse. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. I played up in Federal Way for the uh, the Fourth of July event. It's called the the Red, White, and Blues Festival, and it's this massive outdoor park in Federal Way. It's humongous, and so they hired me to come out and play the Star Spangled Banner, and I play it right when it's just about to go dark. Like I mean, I'm right at the edge. It's like way beyond sunset. It's right when it's going to go dark, and they have it timed. So I'm the last person to play on the stage besides announcing the fireworks. And so right after I play, they're going to start music and the fireworks are going to go. And so my wife and I are like planned because we want to get out of there. There's going to be so many people hitting the road. So the mayor tells me, he says, right after you play, I'm going to play a song I've queued up. And as mayor, I can pick any song I want. And so I was like, oh, but that's, that's interesting. And he, he was like, kind of had a gleam in his eye. And so right when I finished playing, they had stadium lights on. Stadium lights are cut. It's almost completely pitch dark. You can see the silhouettes of the trees. A dark side of the moon plays louder than I could ever imagine it could be played. It was so incredibly loud. The fireworks are just dropping pieces of that kind of burnt paper coming down like raining on us as we're running through crowds trying to get to our car to get out of there as quick as possible. And it's just, I mean, it was bonkers. That sounds like a dream. Yeah, yeah. I played a, a funeral service, and I, I it was outdoors as well. A lot of mine are graveside, so a lot of a lot of them are outdoors. And being in the Northwest, a lot of them are you know in the rain, mm-hmm. whatever. But so it was another blustery day, and I noticed they were setting up the seats, and there was only seven seats set up for this funeral, and so it was a row of four, and then they had a row of three with the space lined up where a fourth chair would go. And so I was like, huh, I wonder wonder what that's about. And so then right as I'm playing, I look over and this guy has like a baby carriage, like a baby pram. Mm -hmm. And in it is a cat and he's wheeling over the cat to sit in that eighth space. And the cat's sitting upright and I'm playing bagpipes, which you think would just terrorize a cat, but the cat was fine. Cat was part of the um, the deceased household, so I guess the cat I learned later on goes to all of the dinner events and everything, which is amazing. And so then, as I finish playing, I'm like, okay, like done with that. Then they do a dub release, 
where doves, like, I think it's, I don't know how many, it's maybe four or something doves release and they do two circles around the edge of the, of like your site. Mm-hmm. And then they fly off. They fly off to the owner's home. Okay. So they're kind of prescribed to know where the owner's home and they'll release them in Eugene and they'll fly all the way back up to the owner's home. The owner's home is in Vancouver and they're getting picked off by um, birds of prey. But yeah, so that was the amazing thing. It's like I finished and it's just like, then there's the ceremonial doves. And and then, so then she contacted me about a year later. It, it was just right before the anniversary. And she had said, you know, I, I really want to um, have like an, another sort of celebration for my mother's passing. And I'd like to do it at the graveside. And I was like, okay, like, sure, you know, I'll be happy to come out and play. So I come out to play and she's the only one there. So it's me and her. And it's so like, just kind of awkward. Like, I'm like, okay, like, I guess we're just <laughs> doing this. And you just played? I just played. She just took pictures and videos of me. So weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It's all, it's all the time, all the time. <laughs> I play. I played one event that was. It was kind of the ultimate in juxtapositions, where I played. I was hired to play on the west side, like in in the West Hills, and you know mm-hmm. Portland's pretty nice. Like, and it was one of the nicest houses I'd ever been to. Like, I have no idea, but the paintings on the walls like looked like they'd been borrowed from the Portland Art Museum, and it was a small event. It was maybe like, I guess maybe like fifteen people. It was catered and it's very much like, you know, you're playing, but you know, you're also like kind of there as somebody to do this service and then you go, yeah. you know, it's like very, which is fine. You know, that's great. It's very easy to do stuff like that. But then I was hired on the other side of town on, on the East side of the river. So like got in the car, drove to, I think rock Creek area or something. And I come up to this house and it's, you know, it's kind of a gnarlier neighborhood, but it's like, I come up to this house and it's like, I can see all the windows have been blackened out. Like they've all got that, the trash bags. And I'm like walking up and it's like a walk through garage where you walk the side of the house, but you're kind of looking in the garage and there's a guy he's like bent over and he's got all these like cell phones disassembled and he's you know busy at work. <laughs> quote unquote. And so I come around to the back and it's like, they're having kind of an informal celebration of life for the young man. So I was going to play and then they were going to have beers and do a barbecue, but you could tell it was, you know, pretty drug influenced. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm like playing and they have a barbecue going, uh, a propane one and it's open just shooting flames up under the, the the overhang of their roof. And I'm like, that is going to catch their roof on fire. And they're just, you know, drinking. And I remember the uncle, the brother of the deceased, talking about how, like, he remembers just getting into Portland and just going, getting into brawls with people and just talking about how, like, you know, kind of the closeness they had. But it was also a pretty intense sort of conversation. And, it was, um, you know, uh, I'm playing and it just had, it had such a juxtaposition. They were also extremely kind, you know, Oh, do you want something to eat? You know, do you want a beer? I think I had a couple beers with them, but they're just like so appreciative. Not that the first experience was anything to be wanting, but that was just like, it felt so different where it's like, they're like, Oh, you know, like you came out and did this thing and it's so important to us. And it was important to the previous people, but it was like, you know, like, what can we get you? And it was, it was somber and it was, they're both sad, but yeah, I kind of do a lot of stuff like that. Play with people that are, you know, you're, you're invited into their houses and they're want to share food and drink yeah. and, you know, talk. Yeah. Have you done many jobs that are celebrations of something uh, fun? I was going to say positive, but a funeral to me isn't necessarily negative. Uh, I mean, just straight out like... A birthday party? 
Yeah, I do. I do do like, you know, celebrations, graduations. I'll get hired okay. to come out and, you know, come out. The the son's graduating from, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, University of Oregon. And I'm, I'm coming down to play after they've received their diploma. I also play a lot of college graduations. That's right. Which is also, yeah. So I'm going to be playing OHSUs coming up and play PACU, Pacific University. I play a lot of graduations. And then I do get hired for, like over COVID, you know, a lot of people wanted to bring bagpipe music to their loved ones that they couldn't see. Mm. So they'd be like, this is a perfect socially distanced instrument. I want to hire you to go play my aunt's house. She's been cooped up in her house for a year and a half. And it'd be nice for her just to hear some music. She loves seeing live music and she can't right now. So this is a great way to do it. So would you just play outside the house? <laughs> yeah. I'd play, you know, open up a window wow. and, and I'd play on the sidewalk or I got hired to do quite a few of those things during the pandemic. Cause you know, it's a, it's a great way to remain connected with folks and you'd have their family members in the street watching as I'm doing it. It's romantic. Yeah. It's, it's you know, and Aunt May hasn't gotten out of the house for a year, so she's tickled, you know. Right. I also played a number of senior living places like that where I would be hired to come out and play outside. And, you know, so those people get, you know, they don't really get to see a lot of people. So it's, right. that's the nice thing about bagpiping is you definitely connect with a lot of older folks that don't get to see music on a regular basis. And Yeah. Yeah, so it's hard to play up at government camp. And usually I'll get these cryptic requests, oftentimes for weddings, where there's really little to no information. They'll be like, hey, can you come out and play, you know, my wedding at government camp? And I'm like, sure. They'll be like, what's, how much is it going to cost? And so I'll, you know, think in my head, like, I'm driving to government camp, and then I'm going to park my car and walk into whatever, you know, facilities to do events. So I'm automatically thinking, you know, they're going to, have me play in the ballroom or whatever they have. That happens often. So it's been planned for months and I'm like getting ready to do it. And then like a week out, they're like, oh, by the way, you need to get there quite a few hours earlier if you want to take, they have a bus that goes up. I'm like, what do you, what bus that goes up? What do you mean? And they were doing the wedding at one of the far flung hikers buildings that are like up the face of the mountain mm. and i'm like oh i had no idea and they're like you got to get there like now instead of i think the wedding was at five you need to get there by 2 30 or something and i'm like oh god i don't want to just spend all day so i'm like well i'll just get up there as quick as possible and i get there and they're like well it's already left so either you can wait here for the next one which is like an hour and a half or something or you can take the ski lift. And I'm like, I've never taken a ski lift before. And I asked the lady, I'm like, well, how bad is a ski lift? And she's like, oh, you know, I'm scared of heights. It's no big deal, really. It's, 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 yeah, it's not a problem. So I'm like, in my bagpipe outfit, I've got my bagpipes in my arms. I wear this hat that's got this feather and the feather is like crazy old and, and crazy rare. You, it's a bird that's now almost hunted to extinction. So you can't even get these feathers anymore. So I'm like, oh, I guess I'll take the ski lift. And there's nobody around. I'm by myself. So it's like there's a ski lift operator, but there's nobody else getting on the ski lifts. And I'm like, I don't know if there's new ones, but it just looks ancient. Like just the bar comes down in front of you. And that's the only thing that's holding you from falling out. I'm holding my bagpipes in one arm and I've got like my hat and feather in my others and just shit and bricks, <laughs> like going so high in the air. And I'm like, I swear to God, I was like starting to have panic attacks. And I did that for 20 minutes. <laughs> Fucking awful. <laughs> oh, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. So then by the time I got up to the top, it's like, 
getting, you know, I'm probably in like a rocky plane flight or something where I'm like, oh God, like, just <laughs> like, I'm so happy to be on flat ground. <laughs> yeah. Did you play okay? Oh, that was the easy part, man. <laughs> After that part, you're like, I can do fucking anything. You want me to cut somebody's hair? I don't know. Like, <laughs> couldn't give a shit. Yeah, it was it was so I mean you're so high up too. That's like you're looking at trees right next to you. The top of the trees are right next to you. You think like, ah, oh, you know, 10 feet, no problem. You're like, this is like 50 feet. Fear inducing. Absolutely fear inducing. I'm like, man, I am gonna get it. so now when I do weddings, it's like you're gonna give me all the particulars. You know, I've had people hire me and they're like, Oh yeah, no problem. It's just this quick little hike. And I'm like, hiking out to the edge of some of those weird ass places along the coast. And one guy had me like going down a little path where if you fall left or right, it's straight to your death. And I'm in these shoes that have no soles. Right. And it's so it's just, you know, like slippery as snot, you know, and I'm sitting there with, you know, two to $3,000 bagpipes. And I'm like, this is insane. You know, and he, he wants me to go all the way out. And then they do this, you know, everybody's like, Oh, I just want to like take the ashes and I want to pour them out. And you're like, you probably don't want to pour the ashes out because I got to tell you how many times I see the ashes pour all back onto people. Yeah. It's like a cloud. You're not supposed to pour out human remains. And this one oh. guy who's a Portland cop, he's like pouring out his dad or something, you know, out in the water. <laughs> it's like, fuck it. Who cares, man? And you're like, yeah, who does yeah. care? But you are somewhat of a funeral culture expert. I've literally done hundreds, if not at least a thousand. It's all over Oregon and Washington. Has anyone ever resurrected at any of these funerals? Not yet. It's going to happen. I'm hoping so. Hopefully while but you're yeah. playing. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, it is, it's, it's always a trip. You know, I started seeing open caskets when I was 15. I mean, you know, I was just like in a funeral home the other day and there's Bud or something in the back room just laying still. I'm still not like 100% comfortable with it. I'm not like, hey, that's neat. I'm like, not sure. So, you know, if I'm playing next to an open casket, I'm not like looking or anything. I'm playing, trying to look over at the you know window in the corner or yeah. something in the room or, you know, something to keep my attention. But yeah, I mean, that's, you know, seeing all that kind of stuff. You're Have you ever made a major mistake during a performance? I don't. I don't want to jinx but you. But I have an amazing story that I've heard Okay. That was the the best I've ever heard. Absolute. Can I cuss? Yeah, all you want. Absolute fuck up ever. <laughs> and this guy, these guys are top players. There's like players in Scotland that are just like brutally good. They're like robots. And these guys are, you know, in the best bands, you know, they practice six hours, you know, three times in a weekend to go compete. And they're just bonkers players. But so this guy... The, the per person who's telling the story is along with his friend who's playing a funeral. And so his friend's all dressed up, you know, geared up, and he's he's playing this funeral service. And he's he's playing in the body. That's also, oftentimes what I'll do. And what many people do is you'll do the processional and recessional. So I'll play and maybe the body's in, in, a, in a casket and it's wheeled in. And then he finishes and he comes back out and his friend's like, I, I don't understand why you played Here Comes the Bride. And his friend is like, no, I played Amazing Grace. And he's like, no, you played Here Comes the Bride. He's like, no, 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 I played Amazing I played Here Comes the Bride. Can you imagine that? So he, and they start kind of the same. Oh my God. So he played Here Comes the Bride. <laughs> <laughs> Was the was now, the deceased a woman? I I never caught Punch that, line. but either way is terrible. Either way is oh, terrible. Yeah. I mean, one is super terrible, and the other one's just terrible. Yeah. But it's like you're like, oh god, that's like, yeah, that was absolute. I I don't play. Here comes the bride. Yeah, and I think specifically because when I heard <laughs> that, I was like, I don't ever want to get those confused. Uh,
Can you tell me a little bit about the kit that you wear when you play? Bagpiping clothes are, you know, traditional. You wear the kilt. Everybody knows what a kilt is. And then I'll wear these heavy uh, socks called hose, and they're woolen hose that go up past your calf, almost to your knee. And they're, uh, it's really kind of nice, especially when you're playing in the winter mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. It's, it can work well. You wear these tongueless shoes called ghillie brogues that have these really long laces that almost kind of look like ballet shoes where they have the laces that are super long. And those are also tongueless, so it's kind of the same thing. But they're, they're wingtip styles. It's like a conglomeration of, you know, all three of those ideas. And then um, you wear what's called a sporin, which is basically kind of a purse on the front of your body, and it's oftentimes decorated. It can be dressed with some kind of special fur. They traditionally were made with a complete animal. So, like, it could be like a raccoon or a wild cat or whatever, and the head will be flipped over the top where it snaps mm. down. And then sometimes they're just plain leather. I, I wear seal skin and I wear plain leather ones. You oftentimes wear what's called a skeen do, which is a, it's called the black knife. And it's a traditional Scottish knife that you keep in your sock. Seems kind of funny, but I actually use it a lot for when I'm playing. So if I need to cut some piece of string and make something tighter in my bagpipes, use kind of a string called hemp in order to make all the joints tighter. So the skeen do is really great. And then I'll wear like a shirt and a tie. And what's traditional is a vest and a jacket. Those are a little shorter than your normal vest and jacket to give more of the kilt, display more mm. of the kilt. And then I'll wear a feather and this type of hat, Glengarry. Also Balmoral, which is kind of similar to your beret. Okay. And that's that's kind of about it. Yeah. Is the feather significant to you or is the feather traditional? The feather is very traditional, but it's gone kind of the wayside. Not re really many people wear it, but um, I picked up on it, and I think it kind of, kind of adds a level of spectacle. Like it, it kind of creates even more of a spectacle that I think is is very sort of handsome, or or I think it's it's interesting, mm -hmm. and it, it's uh, traditional. It's from a pheasant called a blackcock. And it's the whole tail of it is, is, is hacked off at the base. And then it's used as the part in your hat. Oh, and, and you, so what you're looking at as you're looking as if you're looking straight at the bird, it's looking at you and its tail is displayed. And that's what is the feathers that I wear in my, in, in my, uh, Glengarry. So it's very. It was in vogue maybe a hundred years ago. A lot, a lot of people would wear them, and then they've kind of gone out. And I think it was due to them basically being hunted to near extinction. So sure. you can't buy them anymore. They stopped making them in like the late sixties. Right. Yeah. A lot of that stuff, though. My bagpipes have elephant ivory on them. Really. My sporin is seal skin. I mean, yeah, a lot of that stuff is. You know, you can't buy seal skin really anymore. And elephant ivory has been gone since I think the seventies or eighties. Yeah. So yeah, they, they they don't use any of that stuff anymore, which is good. You know, I'm I'm glad that the, they've kind of moved on to better and more sustainable materials. But these old bagpipes all have that stuff on it. What's the material of the bags traditionally? Traditionally, it's uh, sheep hide. Okay. Yeah, I use a, a bovine or cow. Okay. Cow lasts longer. Sheep is pain in the ass, but great. The, what's the channer? Is it a reed or a wood? So the bagpipes consist of drones, which are single cane reeds, mm -hmm. and then the chanter, which is a double reed. So the droning is is the monotonous sound you hear in the background is all single reeds. But now everybody makes them out of man-made materials. They're all nobody uses cane anymore. I don't. I try to use it sometimes, but but I definitely would like to go back to it because cane has a level of harmonics in the sound that is unparalleled. Have you mixed your art rock world and your bagpiping worlds? Yeah. So like we said, Crash Worship, I played a little bagpipes with mm -hmm. them. And then I did uh, a collaboration with Mertzbau, the Japanese mm -hmm. guy. 
a collaboration with him in the early 90s. And then I've done a bunch of stuff with Neurosis and a stuff with a bunch of stuff with Steve Von Till. I was actually out at Steve Von Till's studio, um, like maybe a little over a year ago, and we recorded a bunch of stuff that he's going to use for a uh, release he's got coming up. So definitely enjoy that kind of you know collaborations and yeah. And Steve Von Till is just such a master musician. I mean, that guy, he is incredible. So what he does, I'm always blown away by. Yeah. And do you think, uh, this might be a stretch, but do you think that your attraction to synthesizers is bridged by the pipes, that drone bridge? You know what I think the bridge is, is I think it's um, it's the minimalism. Mm. And I, I got really into German 70s, like kraut rock and yeah. all that kind of stuff, and really minimal. And I think there's a bagpipe form called P-Brock, which is very minimal and repetitive. It's completely different than modern bagpiping music. It's it's hard to describe, and it's very unique. But um, I think my interest in P-Brock learning it as well as you can, you know, it's definitely a huge art form and you've got a long ways to go. That's very much influenced my attraction to synthesizers. I love kind of minimal, weird E2, E4 by Manuel Gotching. Mm -hmm. I love all the just sort of bizarre, simple Klaus Schultz stuff. Yeah. I know, man, you turned me onto a bunch of stuff when we were playing together and I hope we get to do that some more. Yeah, Let's definitely. You know, we'll just carve out some time. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, dude, thank you very much. It's a blast, man. Thank you for having me be here. I was uh, really excited to be on the show. I'm so psyched that you're finding so much joy in this instrument and yeah. in, in yeah. sort of your livelihood. That's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Uh, let's make some weird music or let's make some super straight pop music. Uh, you know, I'll be a winner at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, take care. And uh, I hopefully see you at least on the I-5 corridor somewhere. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll hang soon. Okay. Thanks, man. You Bye. too. Bye. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you after uh, we decided to do this was I was I was thinking back to when we used to, I think, record at your house. And I... I, I pulled up to your house and I think you were like, you had a few cents that you were selling. I think one was like possibly the one that was on a, a Berlin Bowie record or at least the same model or maybe the actual one. Yeah. Um, and whatever, you had a bunch of cents you were selling. And I came over to your house to record. I just pull up and you were like, oh, hey, I think I just sold my cents. And I was like, oh, cool. And then we like walked in your house and I think we sat down in front of the computer resuming and you're like, do you know who Vincent Gallo is? And I was like, I do. And he was like, I think that was the dude that just bought my synth. Yeah. Because he was driving around in the Northwest with a van and had found your synth and stopped by your house. You know, it, no, so it was amazing. Um, he contacted me, I think through eBay. And he, he kept on giving me these weird phone calls. And it was like he was in a car. And I was just, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of weird dudes that collect synths. I'm one of them. And yeah. so um, he's really interested in it. He's in LA. And he's like, I'm going to come to Portland and I'll have cash. And I'm like, okay. And, and it's funny. I had no idea who he was. So he comes to the house. Right. And uh, I'm like, here's a synth. And then he buys it and he's, he's a nice guy. And, and he's talking about like meeting up with an old Portland friend of his, uh, Gus. And I'm <laughs> guessing that's Gus Van Sant. Cause he kept on talking about going to film that films that Gus was making back in the day. And so then, um, I'm like, Oh, well, cool. I'm, I'm glad you got the synthesizer. And, and I'm like, Oh, do you, you, do you make any music? And he's like, yeah, under the name Vincent Gallo. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I've never seen that. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm on uh, what, what Aphex Twins label. Um, and I just had no idea. And it, like, I think it was one of those things where he just like, the more he got into it, the more he realized that I had no idea who he was. 
And it was funny because my total stoner roommate at the time when he was buying the synth walks by and she goes, Hey guys, I'm going to Safeway. Uh, do you guys want any donuts? Oh, it's like, <laughs> it's like fucking the part that was cut out of Buffalo 66. Jesus. Oh uh, yeah. Just, you're just like, I mean, there's, you know, it's like that thing where, you, you know, there's just somebody who's not going to know sure, who you yeah, are yeah. And, and no matter how hard you try. And, but it's, of course, it's so Portland, you walk into a house and people are like, I have no yeah. idea. You know, it's like, she's like a bird specialist, you know, she's out watching birds at five in the morning. She, she has no idea. Like, yeah. you know. Oh my God. It's so funny. It's just Vincent Gallo stopping by on his way to Gus Van Zandt's house. <laughs> yeah. God, that was so funny. And then there was rumors about that synth, strong yeah. rumors that Brian Eno had played it. And the synthesizer had a very particular break in the case. Yeah. Those synthesizers, the EMS VCS3, have a wood, beautiful wooden cabinet. I can't remember what kind of wood it is, um, but it's a beautiful hardwood. And so it had broken and had been reattached, but it's like this crack along the side of it. And I finally found a picture of Brian Eno playing that synth with that crank. And I was like, that's Crazy. the one. Crazy. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. But, yeah. You got to keep living. You got good stories. Ah, well, thank you. I'm, I'm planning on uh, planning on trying. <laughs>